Yeah. So my presentation has ended up being too much bigger than me. Yeah. Oh, that's substantial. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bunk to eighteen oh four, so it should work. Oh, and I'm hot, by the way, broadcasting to the internet, just so you know. Once you finish testing, I will. Uh... Um, this is just a quick reminder if you are presenting at any point in the next few days, please stick your presentation on Google Drive. Um, we have a laptop to present from. Um, and I think you first up, right? Yeah, yeah. So, just so I can take it. Um, you can also bring your own laptop up because we only have open office. We don't have. Um, and so I don't know how well it will render PowerPoint. Uh, what? We have HDMI. We have HDMI. Uh, display mini display port and um, USB C. So, all right, everyone can go ahead and sit down, and we're ready to get started on the first presentations of the day. Richard, can you check that the live stream is actually live? There we go. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. All right, so first of all, I'd like to just, uh, okay, I'll take it a little further away. I see people cringing. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and as my role um, as a PMC chair, I'd like to thank IBM for um, hosting the workshop. I know that's kind of self-congratulatory because I also work for IBM, but um, the, uh, the Boink organization appreciates the support of the community. Um, and you know, I'm very happy to see so many people here in Chicago. Um, as Juan had mentioned, this is the first time that the workshop has been here in the United States. Um, so we were a little bit curious to know how many people would come as opposed to the workshops in Europe and it is well attended. So we appreciate you all taking the time to come out. Um, everything that Juan said about um, participation is very correct. This workshop is for us, by us, us being people in the community. So if you have something that you want to talk about, there, we can fit you into the uh, agenda, um, and you know we can make room because this is a workshop for us by us. So, uh, with that, let me get started. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about the state of the Boeing community and just talking about what I mean by that, what it represents, and uh, um, what I see as the current state of it. Um, my name is Kevin Reed. As I, I might have said, I don't remember. Um, I've been uh, involved in volunteer computing since back in 2000, um, when my brother and I would compete to get as many credits as possible on SETI at home. Um, I think I'm not dissimilar in many people in how you got involved in the community. Um, in 2004, I had the opportunity to get involved. Um, I was working for IBM at the time, and my group happened to be working with the group that uh, launched World Community Grid. Um, so I got to be on the initial website development of it. Um, we originally launched under the Grid MP platform, um, which was built by United Devices. That's why we're different than all the other Boink projects. Um, it's still the legacies of that, even though by 2007 we were fully on the Boink platform, we still have that initial baggage way into the future. Um, the, uh, then in 2000, um, I became chair of the PMC in the, uh, the new organization of the Boink community. One of the things I think is useful uh, before I get talking about the state of the Boeing community is kind of go over a little bit of the history of where we have been throughout um, our history. Um, Boink as a project, an open source project, was started by Dr. David Anderson um, out of the University of California, Berkeley um, in the early 2000s. Um, and he applied for and obtained 
um, a series of NSF grants that funded him and a uh, small core team of developers who did a tremendous amount of work um, over the ensuing years to build the platform to where it was. Um, and so uh, for the many years of the project, um, it was funded by a core team, which allowed its rapid development and growth. Um, in 2015, um, the last of the NSF grants uh, ran out. Um, and so um, David turned the community over to a, uh, a community model that was headed by a project management committee. Um, and um, a number of people helped move the source code on to GitHub um, and turn over to a more traditional community-based open source model. Um, Transitions like that are always, um, when people are used to having a core team of developers where they can say, I want a feature, um, and it gets built for them and they don't have to do any work, people get really used to that. Um, and so the transition model to being a community open source project um, has been a little challenging since then. Um, the first two years, there was um, a lot of quiet on the front. There weren't, I don't, I didn't go back and check, but I can't remember, there may have been no releases for two years or only one release of the client not much development. Um, and so various members of the community began to get concerned about the viability of the project as an ongoing basis. Um, and so they worked with the project management committee to form a working group to review what was going on and um, talk about and come up with proposals to be able to um, encourage broader participation, try to strengthen the community, get more engagement. Um, and so they made a series of recommendations um, at the end of 2017 early 2018, and there's a report out on um, the, uh, I think it's the PMC admin mailing list, um, that details what they found and what they recommended. And then over the last year and a half, a lot of those recommendations have been implemented, and we're starting to see you know, some movement, but there's still a lot of challenges in the community. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of those challenges over the course of this. Um, what do I mean by the Boink community? All right, so the Boink community is, you know, several hundred thousand people large. And I chose horrible colors for this projector, as I can see on the other screen. Um, so I apologize for that. The uh, computer screens, if you can see them, um, have higher color resolution. Um, so the three groups on here are the Boink projects, and these are people who have a need for um, large quantities of computing power and operate the Boink projects that we're familiar with. Um, the volunteers, who are the people who are willing to donate the CPU cycles of their Android phones, PCs, um, whatever computing devices they have access to. Um, and then this other group, which I haven't come up with a very clever name for, I'm calling them the tools and communities. Um, so these are the people like SETI.Germany, who sponsor events to promote enthusiasm across the community. Um, account managers, such as Grid Republic and Science United and BAM. Um, and then also, you know, other things like the people who are using cryptocurrencies like Gridcoin to try to incentivize and promote enthusiasm around the platform. Um, Boink has always encouraged a lot of enthusiasm from the community. And so that's a critical part of the community as well. And between these three groups, this kind of forms the overall Boink community and was, is what I refer to when I talk about the Boink community. Within that Boink community, there is a very, very, very small compared to the 200,000 strong, strong, yeah, 200,000 strong group of people that we do as contributors. And these are the people who are involved with the maintenance and support of the Boink platform itself. Um, and these are everyone from the alpha testers who are testing a client release. These are people who are in the project forums helping other um, volunteers be able to set up the computer, diagnose problems. These are the developers who are making pull requests and contributing to the source code itself. Um, so it encompasses all of those asks, uh, the translators who are translating the website and the client. And so everybody who has been engaged in that support of the client are the contributors. And they're very much also part of the central core that's necessary for the platform to continue to, to continue. Um, the ways that the community interacts is that we have a number of live events um, as well as asynchronous communications. So this annual workshop has been a tradition going back to the early days of the project that brings together um, the projects, the contributors, and the uh, volunteers to just talk about what's going on, on the platform, learn about what's going on, connect, um, and help build relationships that throughout the rest of the year um, allow you know, development to occur and, and collaboration to occur more easily. 
The project calls is something that was recommended by the working committee to try to strengthen court, uh, communication and coordination between different projects, as well as uh, strengthen the, the connection between the projects and the contributors. Um, and that was started in the last uh, 18 months. Um, the contributor calls are similar. They've been started in the last 18 months. The contributor calls have been uh, organized by Keith Uplinger. Um, Bruce Allen from Einstein at Home uh, runs the project calls. He wasn't able to be it here at, um, when he sends his regrets, uh, but he's been the one coordinating those calls. The contributor calls are focused on get, providing a venue every two weeks for um, everybody who's involved in supporting the platform to come together, discuss the issues, um, get pull requests closed, that type of thing. Um, some of the successes of that, I shouldn't steal too much from Keith's presentation, but um, you know, earlier this year, there were 39 some open pull requests. Uh, Lawrence Field from CERN, uh, who's an active participant in those calls, um, really uh, started pushing on getting those closed. And mid last week, we got to a, a long time low of only seven open pull requests. And so, you know, these have been a really good forum for connecting people and helping move um, the work forward. Um, then some of the asynchronous ways that people communicate is on project forums. Um, obviously, we're on GitHub, so there's a rich communication between people there. Um, there's also the Boink forums and the Boink mailing lists. All right, so getting into the state of the community. Um, so here's, I'm going to talk about some trends within each of these different groups. Um, so I contacted Willie DeSutter um, from Boink Stats, and he shared some information with me. And so this is a graph by year of projects that at least had some credit earned on them. Um, over the year. And what you can see is that um, starting in 2004, there was rapid adoption of um, projects, you know, enthusiasm around the platform. And so throughout the 2000s, you, know, you can definitely see the ramp up in the heyday of enthusiasm for the project. Over the next, you know, eight, nine years, there was uh, stability. But then around, I think it's what, 2014, 2015, um, we started to see a drop off in the number of active projects. And this is one of the concerns that we have about the Boeing community is this uh, diminishing um, engagement of, of projects. Willie also, bleh, Willie also shared with me the, um, so this is a graph of the largest projects um, that, and it's the number of people each year that earned at least some credit. Um, and so what you can see on this is that Across all the projects, there's a trend that's been going on for about 10 years now of diminishing participation across the entire platform. Um, and so again, this is one of the concerns is that the number of people participating in volunteer computing has been in a steady decline for a number of years and is one of the things uh, the community needs to address in order to uh, make it a, a long-term sustainable um, concept. When I talk about tools and communities, I couldn't get any hard data to do a pretty graph on. So I'm having to go with um, you know, more anecdotal information. Um, as I said, Boink has always been a rich platform for the newer trends in computing. People have always tried to find ways to attach it to volunteer computing. And so you know, cryptocurrency has a natural pairing with this because they're both using a lot of CPU time. And so we've seen a lot of enthusiasm from various different cryptocurrencies in trying to support volunteer com uh, computing. Um, there's also multiple startups that I've heard of that are working to um, use blockchain to try to um, harvest CPU cycles from uh, different uh, systems. Um, and so uh, this is a concept that has been tried various times throughout Boink's history of leveraging Boink as a way of harvesting CPU cycles from data centers and whatnot in order to turn it into a profitable business where that CPU cycles are then resold to someone else. Um, a lot of times those are met with a little bit of resistance uh, by the Boink community, but in general, they've always been good partners because they help develop the platform as they're trying to achieve their goals. And so from everything I've seen, I've seen the same thing from the uh, latest round of startups. Um, we've also seen um, an interesting phenomenon where some of the major um, US computing centers um, have more need for computing power than they have capacity to deliver. And so they've been looking at um, you know, TAC, which is the Texas Advanced Computing Center in uh, Texas, um, is, has set up a project to allow their researchers to send jobs out onto a grid. 
um, in order to meet the needs of their their uh, constituents. Um, and then NanoHub is is doing something similar, and I think uh, Stephen Clark will be uh, presenting on that uh, later today. Um, and then we still see major teams playing a great role in the community. Um, we have the SETI Germany um, lead here to uh, present. I'm sure you're presenting, correct? Okay. Um, and I'm sure he'll talk about how the pentathlon talked projects offline, which is, what I think, one of his favorite things to talk about. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> it's, uh, he, the pentathlon always uh, encourages a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm around projects and can often act as a stress test for projects um, when uh, their uh, project becomes the uh, featured event. So the fourth group within this is the uh, contributors. Um, and so this is data that was pulled from Insights on GitHub. And um, I have to add, add a few cautions about this graph because it looks really rosy. And so I have to toss, make these cautions now. Um, Boink wasn't added to GitHub until 2014. And so I'm not sure how it tracked committers prior to that point in time. And there was also a, the process for contributing to Boink was often done by sending a patch to the core team and then they would add it on. And so it's not clear to me how it was um, tracking those contributions. So the pre-2015 data could be artificially low. Um, the second thing is that when I was looking at it, I noticed that Keith, who's one of the World Community Grid developers who has made contributions, didn't show up in any of the numbers. And we think it's because his uh, the email address that he has registered with GitHub is different than the email address that he's committed his code under. And so we're not sure if GitHub drops those from its count. So there's several caveats to these numbers. Um, but having said that, I'm hopeful that the trend that we see is in fact a real trend in that we're seeing a wider number of people and we're seeing those people, um, you know, some of them then become a, a uh, more significant contributors. So um, I would like to see a few more years of steady growth to feel confidence in this, um, but it's at least suggesting it's not decaying, which is, you know, a good sign. Um, I also, at this point, have to point out again, um, GitHub provided me good data to make a nice graph from, um, but contributors are more than just the developers. They're all the people who do um, the translations, the support, the alpha testing. I don't have numbers for that, and so I don't want the people who participate in that way to feel left out. Those are very valuable contributions that are necessary for the support of the project. So what are the challenges for the community? Um, the first two that we really need to address is reversing these negative um, trends um, and return to growth on the number of projects that are operating and the volunteer base that's contributing that power. Um, those, uh, those negative trends are obviously highly undesirable and we're gonna have to figure out how to reverse that. Um, we need to continue to grow the number of contributors. Um, you know, we need, you know, we need help supporting volunteers and projects. One of the things is that it does take some work to get a Boink project up and running, and people need help and support to be able to set that up. Um, World Community Grid did a user study about five or six years ago, and we found that among the volunteer base, um, one third of volunteers participate in IT. Um, and if we had only one in a thousand of those volunteers um, become a contributor and help support, um, we'd have twice as many contributors as we have active now. Um, and so it seems like our own volunteer base is a rich field for people in becoming involved and engaging in supporting the entire platform. Um, you know, we have a new release coming up. Other ways that contributors can engage is that we have a new release of the client that's gonna start in the next few weeks. Um, and we need alpha testers. Um, and we've started doing over the last year formal server releases. Um, but that needs a testing process around it. So, you know, one of the areas that would be a rich area of help is that QA, people who are familiar with doing quality assurance testing um, and have been in leadership positions would be of tremendous value to the community. Um, so we're looking to, uh, to attract some people like that. Um, and then we need to continue to recruit and retain developers. Um, even with that positive looking trend, there's, you know, still, one more caveat I have to put in place is that there was a flurry of development last year around um, GDPR compliance. And so that may have artificially skewed last year's numbers. Um, and even though I tried to add the one commit per year, 10 commit per year, 100 commits per year, um, it still didn't really reflect uh, how much of a contribution was being made by the core team 
and how that hasn't really been replaced yet in the new model. Um, and so there's still a need for more engagement and support um, of the platform. And uh, yeah, and the tools and communities are great and we wanna to continue to make sure they, uh, they enjoy working in the community. Um, some of the other challenges are um, coordination and prioritization in a distributed and decentralized environment like this is tough. Um, you know, so what happens is that when people do come looking to contribute, um, they're looking for someone to tell them what to do and there's not a lot of that out there. Um, and so there, there requires a lot of self-starting and a figuring out how to engage. And that's something we're working on improving, but it has a long ways to go. Um, so when you do engage, you know, just have patience with it. You know, you'll, you'll figure it out through experience and we need to improve that. But at the same time, we need people to help us improve that. So it's a, a chicken and egg thing. Um, and we also just need, you know, work to help people change the model of thinking that um, when you state you want a feature, well, think about being the person to implement that feature. It's, um, there is no core team anymore. So we need people thinking that it's a contribution for them to make rather than a, a request for them to make. Um, things that we've done over the last year in order to meet these challenges, I already talked about the projects call and the contributors calls. Those are ways to try to get people talking, get them connected, get them to help each other. Um, out of last year's workshop, one of the concepts we came up with was this notion of using the projects to help us recruit for specific positions. Um, Charlie Fenton, who was the longtime developer of the Mac client, um, had indicated he wanted to take a step back. So we um, wrote up, we did a lot of testing of uh, all of his documentation that he'd done. We uh, worked with projects to do a job posting to try to get people who might have Mac development skills interested in supporting it. Um, we did have one person who came along and uh, has done some contribution. Um, however, there hasn't been much for him to do because so far we haven't done a new release and there haven't been any major bugs identified in the platform. Um, and so that's one of the other challenges we face is that we, we need specific skills, we need them to stick around but sometimes it may be six months before anything needs to be done with it and those people may drift away. And so it's an, it's an interesting challenge. Um, so the questions I have for this workshop um, and to think about over this workshop um, over the course of it is, you know, what can we do to meet these challenges? Um, Juan talked about the uh, design thinking activities that we're going to be doing. And um, each of those structured brainstorming sessions is going to be about um, talking and brainstorming and coming with ideas on ways that we can meet some of these challenges. Um, the first one that we're going to take on, we'll be talking about the volunteers and how we can um, attract and retain more volunteers for the community. Um, and so that'll be a great way to do these ideas. But I also want people to be thinking that as they're going through these brainstorming ideas, that if we come up with a list of things to do um, that we can pin on a wall and send out an email to the community, you know, that's nice, but we need the next step of how can you help make those things become reality? Um, and, you know, to feel empowered that, you know, you don't need someone to say, yes, go forth and do this. You can actually just say, okay, this is a great idea. I can move forward and do that. Um, so hopefully we can uh, come up with some ideas and we can uh, develop some enthusiasm around engaging and participating. Um, and that's what I've got. Questions? No questions means everybody went to sleep and I'm sad. <laughs> okay. Here from Tech Power Up. Just hold it closer. Yeah. And uh, a lot of our users are IT, uh, and so I'm wondering, you know, what? I guess I, I could talk to you more about it, later, but I don't know what kind of commitment. You know, how often are those calls? Are they going to have to be on every call? We can get your call. Yeah, I just oh, want to like be able to tell them what's going on. Yeah, I'll go over that in a little bit. I've got a presentation that's more of that. Yeah. Uh, about the future call, but it's short answer is relax. And so, it's going once a month, right? And it's every other week. So, so. All right. So that's one over there. Yeah. Eric. Uh, yeah. Uh, You're pretty loud. Yeah, I'm loud. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I think it says that on <laughs> um, So, yeah, regarding the uh, user decline, and I admit that it's uh, it's a problem, uh, 
and to some extent, I think it has more to do with societal trends. Uh, who's got a desktop computer anymore that they leave on all the time? Uh, everyone has gone to, at least uh, apart from people in, in IT or sciences, uh, everyone's got a tablet that uh, shuts itself off uh, when they set it down on the counter. Uh, so to some extent, uh, that's a very difficult thing to combat. Uh, uh, we uh, do have to do a better job of contracting on people who do still have desktop computers or laptops that they leave on all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that statement that it's getting harder to attract the people, but um, we have to keep challenging ourselves to, to push forward on it. see like a trend of like cryptocurrency mining is inverse to the participation in, in one projects over the past uh, five years or so. Um, and you're right, most people don't uh, have desktop computers anymore. Uh, but the PC, the PC gaming space is has been growing like crazy and the, you know, the PC based GPUs and things like that. So there still is a massive, massive untapped amount of computing power just sitting there. And a lot of people that don't understand how, don't even care, you know, about how all this stuff works, right? <clears throat> so I think a lot of it is just uh, communication. Another uh, platform. So I'm wondering if any survey can be taken as to, or a hat dropped out of thinking of the uh, volunteers. I mentioned between the Android and laptop, there's a lot of platforms available. Is there any reason that you can find that? So I know there's been some uh, work done on user surveys. Occasionally some professors will take a look at it and write up a, a article. I, um, I'm not going to say what I remember because I don't trust whether my memory is tainted by my personal opinion versus the actual results of those. Um, I think it comes down to people generally either, yeah, I'm contradicting myself, aren't I? Um, a lot of times it's people don't want to use the power. Um, and it, um, sometimes it's fan noise on the computer, um, or they ran it for a while, didn't really connect with it, and then when they upgraded, they drifted away. Um, Eric? Yeah, uh, we uh, actually do keep a statistic of, of residence time of a machine um, on SETI at home. And uh, early on, it was about 36 months. It was basically the, the time that if someone put a machine on, it would be half of them would be gone within three years. It's down to about 18 months now. Uh, and with Android devices, it's three or four months. Uh, and I don't know if that's because uh, point does tend to be a little bit hard on Android devices. Uh, I have stopped using it on my phone <laughs> because, uh, yeah. Uh, and even when I use it, I set uh, my uh, maximum temperature to 35. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. They say these batteries work to 80C. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> I should probably be lending this mic. Yeah, when you're up here presenting, just so you know, this mic is for the room. This mic is for the live stream. So um, everybody will be mic twice. Other comments, questions? All right. Thank you very much. Keith, over to you.
eight of them were me. Right? Eight of them were me. <laughs> but one of us you, one of us Richard. I don't know if this one counts, but. While that's loading, I, I kind of wanted to add something to it. So in order to increase the points visibility, um, why can't we partner up like with a computer manufacturer, let's say, and put like, oh, certified by point, you know? Like some computers come with, oh, certified by NVIDIA, GeForce, blah, 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 like with a sticker and everything. Why can't we have that with point? Because I think that would be the way to increase visibility community itself and on top of that um, I believe one of the reasons that the Boyd community is going down is because I mean I just freshly graduated from college and most people at college now use the computers that are in their labs instead of having their own computers with them so it's kind of like like I have some friends who did point before but then at the same time the issue is that it drains battery and most of the lecture halls don't have like a power plug, like the electric plug to plug their computer into. So it's just like, okay, so I can't run it in class. So I can't really contribute during the day that, you know, where the most active computers are, you know, on like during the day. So I just wanted to add that. So uh, yeah, one of the things that we'll be doing this afternoon is to break, you know, doing those mining activities in the soft community to really talk about and brainstorm ideas. So to this other one. Something that's going to sort of provide to follow on. So the projects represented here, how many, how many projects have actually got institutional issues by people to join the Stay, we're going to have you know people ranting at the 
VIP department, hey, why is my computer heating up? Like, so I personally don't believe in the opt-in portion of what you said, um, but pre-installed, like getting the visibility out there, like the documentation of if it, like documentation that a company can go by to tell their employees, hey, you do, there's a way for you to contribute your CPU cycles to the greater of the society by just leaving your computer on and not taking it home. I mean, it's just kind of. So another idea we've tried is we had a partnership with Sony when they installed Lenovo's. Um, no, they didn't install BIOS. BIOS. Um, so where the partnership with them is basically the way they had it set up was what we did was install on every Sony bio sold in the US. So as a Sony bio customer, it's already there. You still make the decision to say, do you want to actually activate your Sony account? And so that actually was a really good model. So that's kind of the hybrid between the first and first one. We had a, Jonathan, you had your hand up? And we, we do have that, uh, we have had uh, some success with some of those like Syracuse for us, they installed as a backfill on their, uh, yeah, on their condor. Um, and then also uh, Marist College, also they installed in their labs and things like that. It's just trying to get the initial, you know, finding the person who will actually install it at those specific universities. Because like you said, universities have computer labs with say 100 machines and they've got 10 of those labs throughout the university. And you're like, okay, well that's a lot of power just sitting there on during the day when no students are actually using them. So, uh, but anyways, yeah, yeah, it's outreach and it's trying to, and like if you can, if at your own personal university that you graduated from or whatever, if you have someone that you can contact, you can reach out and you can say, hey, why don't we do this for our own university and we can publicize that, hey, we're doing something, you know? Oh, oh, go ahead, man. turned out in, in New York City, every single school had uh, authority over the computers in, in their school. There was no central authority who could say, well, the commissioner of schools can't just say, put it on all, all, all the things. It was similar at, at most universities we talked to, where each department actually procured their computers separately. And uh, so there was no one person who could say, put it on, you had to go person by person by person, which is a, a kind of long-winded way of saying it's extremely labor intensive. It looks like an easy win, but but it would take us sort of, it's possible as a yeah. community we can coordinate around that, but we should be under the agreement that it's going to be able to keep up with that a lot more than the skill balls is that there's a couple countries knowing it can be with one another. And you'd be very surprised how, yeah, it's a huge problem at the university. Well, another thing to remember is that it's very rare that a IT manager has extra time. You know, so this becomes, you know, a decent amount of work, a risk to the system, possibly creating complications for them, and they don't have time to figure that out. And so that's where, it, like, the, the resistance is not necessarily to propose the idea, but it's one of 500 things they have to do. And so it's, it's uh, you know, we, I think one of the things, this is probably my personal thing, I think one of the things is to say, it's, oh, you install it, and you're done, has been a mistake because, one, it doesn't acknowledge people are paying for the electricity bandwidth, whatever. And I think if we had really marketed it as this is a way for you to donate that whole person thing, you know, would change the expectation I think in a positive way. Um, but that, that's not an opinion. Okay.
Uh, well, we've got Mark. He's had his hand up for a little bit here. Do you have something you want to add? Okay. Okay, and we had a comment from William over here.
Makes sense. Yeah. Can you split the work units into multiple sizes? Because, I mean, I do. We've thought about. <laughs> it's only a short 10 minute presentation, then we have um, a break with coffee and beverages. That'll be a great time for your thing. Yeah. Well, mine might not even be 10 minutes. All right, seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, oh, I got to get my microphone. All right, uh, there we go. Um, so, I'm good. Yes, it's black on black. Yes. Okay, so. Welcome everyone, I'm Keith Uplinger. I'm, uh, as it says here, I've been with Grid Com Computing, which was Globus and things like that with IBM as an intern when I first started working back in 2002. Um, and then also been with World Community since 2005, working on them. I'm now on the lead, uh, technical lead for World Community Grid. Um, and then since 2015, yeah, I've been a member of the Boink PMC and about in 2018, I was a secretary of the Boink PMC. So I take notes, basically. Um, I'm also, as y'all, someone that got my tag earlier, I'm from Texas. So if I have a draw, sorry. Um, so anyways, I'm move on. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to do about the contributor call is I'd like to thank a few people um, who have been involved with contributor call, but also with contrib contributions towards Boink. Um, so like Adam and Vitaly working on the Android client, I think they're actually preparing to release a version of the new Android client with uh, the next version of um, Boink. I think 7.16 is the next client. Um, so Vitaly and uh, David are working together on that, um, as long as, as well as Christian Beer and uh, Charlie and all the, uh, like I said, there's a bunch of people I'd like to point out. Um, Lawrence, he's been on the contributor call very much every, uh, every week we have it. Um, he's a server release manager. So for all the Boink projects, when they're pushing out, you know, the new versions and stuff, when they're updating their servers. Lawrence has been, we released version 1.0 earlier this year, and we're on 1.0.4, um, but he's been instrumental in that as well. Um, and then Richard Hasselgrove, who's back there, he's not, not raising his hand too high, but yeah, there you go. Um, Richard's been also on the calls helping. He's been helping uh, basically translate some of the issues that some of the other volunteers that have issues and bringing them to us and then trying to also test and help with all of that. And then also, Kevin, you're on there as well. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyways, the contributor call, um, it happens every other week. Um, we have it at two different times, so it helps with the time zone uh, issues for people. Um, but the goal of the meeting is to basically open up communication lines between developers um, so that if something, say, Kevin has a pull request out there and there's an issue that I don't like that he has on it. During this call, Kevin and I would have talked before, but if we were not part of the same World Community Grid, we would actually discuss and say during this call, like, how can we work this out? Let's make compromises, figure out where we need to go from there. So that way the pull request can continue and move forward. That's one of the goals of the uh, contributor call. Um, and actually, like I said in the next line, help move them in a positive direction so that way they don't get stalled and sit on the pull request board for. Um, at one point, we had some that were two years old sitting on the pull request board of GitHub waiting to be merged. Um, Kevin also ruined this stuff for me earlier. Um, we had 39 pull requests in January. And with Lawrence and Richard and Kevin and a few and other people that Germano has been on the calls as well, um, we have brought those pull requests down. We had seven uh, earlier last week. Uh, I think we're back up to 10, but that's still good. It's healthy. It's moving. Things are going in the right direction. Um, and then also on those calls, uh, we do, we work on the new, uh, features of Boink, things that are discussed. There were things along the lines with, uh, uh, the GDPR that was discussed on those calls and how we can work through those as well. So, um, currently the format, um, it's changed a little bit since we first started. 
Uh, we do a quick report uh, from David, who's the client release manager, Lawrence, and then Kevin, uh, just a quick overview of what's going on in the community so the contributors know what's happening. Um, and then we go into the pull request discussion to see what we can work on through those. Um, sometimes those pull request discussions are pretty quick. Uh, and so then we'd be able to move down to issues that have been raised in the Boynt community. Uh, we've been trying to focus recently on the blockers in the GitHub um, and also critical items and trying to clear those out. I know there's five blockers right now, and I think three or four of them are due to the Android client, which we might be able to see those clear up when the new Android client gets released. Um, and then time permitting at the end of the call, we also talk about other hot topics if there's anything else that needs to be discussed. Um, so it goes pretty quickly. The call is generally we try to keep it right at an hour. So that way everyone has busy lives. We can get, you know, back to what we need to work on. Um, and just to call out, so everyone here, everyone's welcome. Even if you don't contribute calls, if you're a volunteer, uh, or if you don't contribute code, you're uh, just a volunteer, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, these are the next few meetings for the next two months, in essence. Um, like I said, we rotate between 1200 UTC and 1800 UTC, which uh, for Americans, it's uh, 7 a.m. Central and uh, 1 p.m. Central. Um, anyway, so that's what we've, we've done. Um, we've had over 20 since the last workshop and participation varies so um, but everyone's welcome to join like i said um and if you can please um also it gets announced on the boink mailing list um boink dev so you can see where it's posted which i usually try to post a day or two before saying what time it is um but then also the agenda there's a live agenda on the google docs um for what's going on so uh comments or questions about the contributor call hope i answered some of them from earlier I see what you're saying, like how to get, how basically the, okay, so basically the question is, uh, Richard has a group of people that he knows that uh, are in technology and basically they need to, uh, how can they start with Boink from basically the ground up, basically their rookie, you know, um, so Kevin and I, uh, there's a documentation that the straw man for some of that that needs to be written up, um, that's not out there yet. Um, it's on my to-do list, really. Um, I haven't gotten to it. Uh, about the documentation. Yeah, there is some existing documentation on how to contribute. But I think if someone's coming full and doesn't know what all contributing is, it would be a lot of work to catch up. I would almost say that if they're not familiar with it, they should start being a volunteer first and learn what it's all about. And then start learning it. So, so Yeah, yeah, that that's one of the goals in the future is to help all that. We have a question in the back. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. So one of the things that we've talked about is the idea of having a, you know, we have the projects call, we have the contributors call. There's been conversations about having a volunteer call in order to um, focus on the marketing issues, the, the recruiting issues around volunteers. Um, and that's somewhere where it, it falls out because
because for the large part, a lot of the people who are deeply involved in Boeing are highly technical, and that's not a skill that has been very easy to jumpstart. And so many of the areas, um, having the community say, hey, I want to start organizing this, I, I fully support people starting it up. So, and then also I think that talking to people like um, I forget your name, Patrick, who does like SETI Germany, which they are essentially doing a lot of marketing and promoting and volunteer participation. And that's where the tools and communities have traditionally played in that role, but not in an organized sense. It's kind of important. They, they do their own thing, they develop their own community that supports it. But something that's the meta around all of those, I think would be a tremendous value. And there's, so we use uh, TeamSpeak for all the communications, like the, to do the conference calls. So th that uh, TeamSpeak channel is open 24 uh, seven and the links are to it on various point documents. So anyone, if you had to say you and a few other people wanted to get together and talk about stuff, there is a way to use that as well as something to uh, have a, basically a call that you don't have to worry about setting up, uh, you know, your own international line and all that fun stuff so okay any other questions or comments all right i think everyone's ready for snacks or drinks i think it's just drinks break all right so, beverages are outside uh, we've got until 11 o'clock i think is when we can Okay, so back in here at 10.55. Who's the next presenter? Yes, okay.